Okay, a warm welcome to everyone to our seminar this afternoon. We are very happy to have our colleague Michael Wong, uh, who is the program manager for safety, respiratory, and protection systems. Basically, uh, everything that do with breathing apparatus, escape apparatus, chemical protection suits. Uh, Michael supports us in this region, especially in the ASEAN region. And we hope that today you all will be able to take something home about this uh, topic on escape respirator. It's uh, very common that this uh, device are often neglected, but it plays a very important role in life saving. Having an escape respirator in the right place to protect your staff employee in a very risk plan operation. So we hope today that you will be able to learn something from us and we, we would like to encourage you to participate in the question and that you will that you can raise along with the presentation. Without much delay, I would like now to extend and uh, invite Michael to share with us about this topic. Michael. Hi, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Yu. Um, so a very warm welcome and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm the product manager for safety, respiratory and protection equipment for the ASEAN region. Um, I'll be supporting the size Asia with all basically respiratory equipment and also safety products itself. So uh, without further ado, I will start off with the webinar itself. So the topic for today is actually escape respirator for your emergency response blend. Um, this is actually where we talk about uh, the escape products or respirator all the way from the standard mouthpiece to even supply air respirators and how it actually adds on to your emergency response plan or risk analysis as a plan itself. So with any process involved hazardous material, the primary goal is to prevent the release of the substance. However, there should be means of protecting the workers in the event of these controls actually designed or failed, not, not functioning as per design itself. So what we actually meant here is that it's actually a three-staged uh, support from just not just containment of the hazards, material and not just backup control, but it's also actually to provide escape plans in any case of all these plan controls actually fail. So the agenda for today, uh, I'll briefly touch on the three latest tools of hazardous material risk management, followed by performing a process of hazard analysis, or actually we know of as a risk analysis, some of the recommendation that we have actually provided to you. And also we'll talk about how to identify the best escape respirator for your application and the pros and cons of the different respirator type itself. So um, the three layers two of hazardous material risk management. So before I actually start off, I'd like to show a video just for sharing. Generally, itself, what really happened in this accident is um, actually there is a lack of controls and the backup plan. And what happens is that steroid is supposed to be a chemical to store below 25 degrees, but there is no controls in terms of how to keep the chemical under that particular 
temperature. And what happens is that actually there is an increase in the temperature that should cause chemical reaction to leak off the sterile gases. So there is also lack of gas detection in that area to monitor and transport our monitoring systems. So with all the controls being built, it actually um, becomes an anxious part to actually leak out the gases from this particular incident. So the three layers two of hazardous material itself. So according to several regional regulations and recommendations, such as example we use in general of our region, the OSHA to inline. The, guideline, um, the guidelines and recommendations for process management, the risk analysis has to be undertaken and countermeasures must be implemented. Personnel working with any hazardous process should be protected by at least three lines of defense. So the three lines of defense must be operated in unison to provide an effective hazard control plan. You can think of this approach as a three-step approach in validating the working with hazardous material. The first part itself, the containment. SOP or Center Operating Procedures and engineering controls are designed to control all hazardous substances. For example, keep it contained using appropriate devices, piping, the valves, and also process design specification. The backup control itself, which have the control of mitigate exposure to the workers and the environment in the event. At the first step of defense is compromise or build. For example, controlling system with relief valves, scrubbers, press, or even search overflow tanks. And most important in a way is actually the emergency response plan. Protect the plant and human assets by providing means of escape response in the event that step one or two fail. Depending on the risk and hazard, this can change actually from a simple evacuation plan to a complex emergency response scenario, which including what we're talking today, the escape respirators, or even escape refuge chambers and zones. If, sorry, if these three elements are not operating together, then the likelihood of a disaster or fatality is exponentially high. In many cases, it's usually the third step that's being enacted. Escape respirator as part of the emergency response plan are sometimes seen as a necessary evil or redundant compliance requirement because an escape respirator will not prevent any emergency situation from happening. In other words, the organization with good SOP and fail safe plans may feel that it can prevent an incident from occurring. So it does not really require to invest in good escape respirators. However, from what we know of, many industry, industrial disasters of the past have resulted from the false sense of security in SOPs and fail safe. In many of these cases, loss of life could actually be prevented by a strong emergency response program. Acquiring the right type and the quantity of escape respirators is just as much as part of the risk management as trying to prevent the release of hazards in the first place. The presentation today is actually focused in the third step, which is actually the hazardous material risk management. Specifically, it covers the type of respirators which are available and identify the best application for each and evaluate the pros and cons of each technology. In many of our cases, we are actually interested to strengthen the third step, which I mentioned just now. The first thing to do is actually to perform a process hazard analysis, or we know as PHA, to identify the risk in the workplace and consequences which will result in your SOP and COSAS malfunction. While there are many industrial hazards and risks, the presentation focuses on the three most common types of industrial hazards. The first part itself, the risk of fire. Fire is a risk that is actually virtually every industrial setting, but also the highest risk occurs when personnel are exposed to accumulating smoke. Most of the fire-related deaths are actually due to carbon monoxide poisonings and not burns. Any industry uses high heat processes or flammable materials must be well prepared for fire hazards. The next we're talking about is actually the release of the toxins. This include the release of chemical, vapors, or gas on the process or vessels at high concentration. Where this is actually normally identified by the PHA, example, the hydrogen sulfide, which can be released from any oil drilling rigs or underground, or even toxins such as chlorine and phosphine to actually be released from the chemical process. Last is actually what we talk about environment polarity. This is a common risk to the human respiratory system because at the atmosphere that is likely to change and become more dangerous, for example, such as confined space, the, content, the condition itself changes very quickly. Gases 
whether it is toxic or actually oxy, um, oxygen deficiency causes to actually lay low in the different confined space area that can cause lack of oxygen and even include death. So uh, before this, I would actually like a poll question to everybody. So will the escape respirator or gas mask protect me if there is not enough oxygen in the air? So especially the result is here. Um, as long as it's this, but actually the escape gas mask does not protect you if there's not enough oxygen. That has to be dependent on the ambience air where the oxygen contains itself. So if the evaluation that you are working in the open area scenarios, um, there will be ambient oxygen in the contaminated air should any accidents happen. But if you are working in confined space area or actually oxygen deficiency area itself, you will actually need a special type of escape rest um, product, which is usually called as EBD, to actually supply the correct breathing air itself. Okay, so once the risk, the type of the risk has been identified, the next step for us is actually to understand the degree of severity which would accompany an emergency situation. So this is just a sharing of the information when it comes to selecting the appropriate escape respirators. For well, this example basis, we use the general term from the IOSH, which we classify under high, specific, and low. High is actually for any scenario involving a relief of existence of unknown toxic substances in high or unknown concentration as well as an oxygen deficiency atmosphere. Specified is actually any scenario that involves the release or existence of known toxic substance in any concentration. While low, that's actually in scenarios involve the release of existence known toxic substance in low concentration. Understanding this type and degree of risk will serve as a good foundation for selecting the respirator which are qualified for your application. However, just because a respirator will work does not mean that it's the best choice. You will also need to consider the pros and cons of all qualified respirators to ensure that you are maximizing the safety and reducing the cost of ownership for the company. For example, even though an air compressed air type respirator may work well as an application, there may be many good reasons to use a smaller, more portable, and less expensive escape devices. So ultimately, you could actually save money and make a workplace safer by evaluating all available options. Uh, next, I'll actually touch on, um, we actually talked about the fire causing um, risk scenarios itself. So this may not be industrial related, but it actually is a very good example um, how actually fire can cause a uh, catastrophic situation. So in 2017, uh, a fire broke out in 24 Story Rifle Tower in London. So it actually caused 72 deaths and including two of the victims who died later in the hospital. Well, most of the health injuries and deaths are actually caused by inhaling or smoke carbon monoxide itself. So this is a reference from the BBC UK. The firefighters could not actually reach the top on, in time because the fire actually started off in the low levels. A lot of the victims are actually stuck at the top floor and inhale the carbon monoxide that caused them to actually faint and could not escape in time. So now I'd like to show a short clips of uh, the news in regards to firefighters and also for the victim escape using the escape smoke hoods. In a fire, smoke can be a killer. Firefighters wear breathing sets. But until now, residents trapped inside a burning building have had no protection. But at last, they've got this. It's called a fire safety hood. These hoods will provide reassurance to the public that if they are trapped by the effects of smoke, that if we do need to move them through the smoke environment, we will have this capability that uh, firefighters can deploy. They give 15 minutes protection through toxic gases. How does it work? There's an optical light chemical in there. It's actually a catalyst that inerts the carbon monoxide and converts it into a gas that's not, not harmful. After 15 minutes, we can take this hood off, put another one on, and we can just keep doing that as long as we need to do it. This would have been invaluable at Grenfell, where firefighters reached very high up floors that residents couldn't come out because of the toxic fumes. Incredible to think that this has been available in Germany for many years 
and only cost a hundred and seven pounds. So what really happens is that um there's no escape hood in plan um for actually buildings. For the company scenarios itself, you can actually implement escape hoods, escape fire smoke hoods in various strategic locations where fire risk is a prominent situation, I mean a causing situation devices. And from what we experienced in this particular situation that we actually supply to the London fire brigades or the emergency smoke hood that's actually attached to the firefighters on all their SCDs that as an emergency response situation for the victims. So identify the best escape respirator for an application. So once we actually identify the risk itself, the next step is to identify the correct escape respirator for the application. This is an essential two-step process. First, we need to narrow down the option to the escape respirators, which will provide effective protection. Second, we need to consider the pros and cons of the different respirator types to identify the best option. There's a number of widely accepted escape respirator technologies in the market, such as air purifying respirators, which including the escape mouth bits, full face masks, or even escape hoods, which we saw just now. We also have self-contained emergency escape breathing apparatus, we also have actually pressure demand supply air respirators with escape cylinders. Most of these respirators can be used in multiple application or situation. The chart we show here actually summarizes the type of hazard that each technology will protect against. So in general for fire escape, usually we recommend for the escape hood itself or supply air. The escape hood actually covers the whole of the head that prevents smoke or any irritants to get into the eyes itself. While for toxics or low hazard, um, you can actually, or specific hazards, you can actually use the escape mouthpiece or escape respirator. For well, this presentation, it will be hand, there will be handouts supplied, I mean, sent over to by email to you guys. So you can actually use this chart as a reference for your consideration. However, it's, it's very important to know that to identify the best respiratory protection, the escape devices, the local exposure limits of the potential hazards must be taken into consideration. So we have an example over here, which is a H2S. If the exposure limit of the hazard is like H2S over here is at 5 ppm, the potential level of the contaminant will be at 16,000 ppm as per desired by the local HSC. That means the local HSC will actually give a check and evaluation that the maximum concentration should an accident happen will be at 60,000 ppm. So the potential factor of the escape device of 10,000 has to be considered for choosing the H2S. For trigger, we are actually able to provide to you your local um, maximum occupational exposure limit via our website. You can actually visit our Dragon Voice link that you can key in the contaminants that you might be potentially exposed to during an accident. And you can find out the local occupational exposure limit to do the calculation of which type of escape respirator will be suitable. So I have another question again. Uh, if I have the right cartridges and filter for a certain hazards and my mask fit, will they always protect me? Okay. We have majority saying yes, but in the actual fact, no. Again, like I mentioned, you really have to evaluate the potential maximum concentration that the chemical gradually lose. In certain scenarios, um, if the respirator does not have the right protection factor and the filters of the escape respirator could not contain the concentration itself, it could actually go into your body or actually, I mean, you will inhale the contaminants during the escape. So that you might need to use a supply air or compressed air escape respirator in, according to this. Okay, so next I'll actually touch on the pros and cons of different respirator types. So for Dragon, we are actually offering not just the escape respirator, but we also offer, in general, the escape respirator device plus research chambers and customized engineering solutions that depending on your application and your company location as well. So example, for our mining customers or underground builders, we are able to offer research chambers or engineering solution that is customized to the requirement of local regulations and your requirement. In other general industry or uh, refining and plants itself, we are able to offer the escape hood or supply air respirators. So let's go a slightly deeper into each of these escape respirators. 
the most common type of escape respirators is actually what we know as the escape mouth beat or the heart mask. So this actually provides the escape time between 5 to 15 minutes and with a service interval between 4 to 12 years. The 4 to 12 years is not the maximum maintenance-free service interval, but it's usually at the half point, the time where you actually do the replacement of the filters. This type of escape respirator has is very light and it's very portable. Usually, we recommend the customers to have their employees to carry each of the respirator on themselves at all times. So in any situation, they can actually don on immediately. However, the concerns about this is it does not protect the eyes or head. So during the evaluation, if let's say that the leak of the hazardous materials will actually give irritation to eyes, we recommend this escape small food instead. So for our Parat 3000 series itself, we actually offer it in two different variants. One is the mouthpiece and one is on the respirator face back. So the mouthpiece do not usually require a fit testing and it's more acceptable for the region. However, training is required. But for the normal respirator type, a fit test is required to ensure the guy actually has a face fit still on the escape respirators. Next, it's not commonly recommended, but it actually can be used. It's actually the full face mask with the filter in a seal bag. So the escape time is not specified because it is depending on the class of the filters for evaluation. And this can be used for more than one escape only scenario. It can be used for working scenario as well. So it could, depending on the different industrial requirements, it could be used. However, it's difficult to don during emergency situation and it's not and never designed as an escape unit. So for this product as well, we are actually offer our Xbox 6000 series with the multi gas filters as the most recognized full face mask in the market that comes with high capacity um, chemical filters that protect from very wide range of filters that even include carbon monoxide for 20 minutes. And next, in, from our all air respirator, air filter respirator, uh, escape respirator itself, is actually our escape smoke food. The escape time is actually at least 15 minutes. Uh, for testing requirement, we actually go more than 15 minutes, but in general, it's actually at, at least 15 minutes of escape time. So the service interval is around eight years with additional eight more years with the change of filters. So it provides effective protection against specific toxin and it protects the eyes, face, and head. So as I mentioned just now, if the chemical leaks or the accident happens with chemicals that can cause irritants to eyes, this will be the uh, recommended solution itself. This, the SK hood even enable verbal communication. So for victims that are actually waiting for rescue, this is very efficient. It's easy to don. However, for all the respirators that I mentioned, mentioned just now, from the SK mouthpiece all the way to the SK hood, it cannot be used in O2 deficiency atmosphere, which means it cannot be used in confined space or area that is gases that could remove the O2 concentration scenarios. For the escape hook, we actually have three different versions from Dragger, the 4000, 5000, and 7000 series. Each gives a very unique industrial application. For example, for the 4000, it's actually designed to protect against chemicals. For the 5000, it's actually designed to protect against fire or smoke-related scenarios. For the last 7000 series, it's actually designed to protect both chemical and fire. So a table is just for referencing. The 4,000 on toxic industrial gases, the ABK 15 minutes, fire escape is 5,000, and last is a combination of all. That actually suitable for after analysis that chemical fire actually occurs in your plant or application. In a scenario where there's oxygen deficiency, we will actually look at oxygen self-rescue itself. We offer the Oxy 3,000 and 6,000, which will last for the escape time between 13 minutes to 60 minutes. It's acceptable to use in O2 deficient atmosphere because of the chemical reaction that actually gives you O2 during the escape breathing. It's easy to don as well. So this is actually some of the feature benefits from the Oxy-3 and 6000. It's a one-hand operation device that you can actually using a single hand to escape during emergency situation, especially and design. This is designed especially for working in underground tunnels or even in underground coal mine situation. And the long escape time 60 minutes to uh, allows you to actually run to the nearest escape within the next 
hour so that even there's a long distance of walking, you are still safe. We also have equipment which is called SPA. It actually, actually works with supply airline. So in any situation that you're, you are working in confined space and your supply air fails and you require an escape immediately, you could remove the connection airline and turn on the cylinder for escape. This allows workers to actually simply switch from the supply air to escape mode without exposing to any of the hazards. The usually positive pressure and acceptable to use in O2 deficiency scenarios. So the model pass cord and micro is being offered. Um, it actually comes in a sling mode or a back carry harness mode, depending on your application and depending on your entry level to the confined space area. In many general terms for supply air, we actually have what we call the escape emergency breathing apparatus, or some call it devices. This is normally used in the marine and offshore oil and gas customers. Uh, it's actually used in the O2 deficiency atmosphere where the continuous flow of air in a hood model that supplies 15, 5 to 15 minutes of escape, depending on the chosen model. So it's reusable. That means the model really wants if any accident happens, you can actually send back to us. We can actually do the servicing in terms of replacing the hood or actually fill out the escape cylinders. So this is how it looks like for the saver TS when you actually remove the hood. It's a, it's a sling operation mode. Once you take out the hood, it automatically starts off the whole escape procedure. The air will start to flow in and you just turn in like a smoke hood. Next is actually what we call um, saver PP. It's actually positive pressure. So instead of the escape hood itself, you can actually provide this in full face mask mode for specific customers that use this specific uh, situation. It's uh, based on a lung demand. This is that means you only breathe as per required. So it actually prolongs your escape timing as well. Last, we have what we call the self-contained breathing apparatus. Um, this is what is the usually used for confined space area that links with supply A. And in any situation, you need a longer period of escape timing of up to 45 minutes, the SDVA could be offered. So we usually, for customers, we offer the PSS 3000 series. This can come to a 6.8 liter cylinders and uh, last up to 40 minutes for escape time. However, I uh, just want to highlight on this presentation itself. Once you have chosen the respirator for your application, there is one very important final step which is necessary to turn out a good emergency preparation program. This is training. You can have the best respirator or escape product in the world, but it will be useless if the user does not know how to put it on. So while most people hope they will never use the escape respirator, anyone who could potentially need to use one should be trained, and which is regularly and frequently. How to don the device quickly and effectively and it's important to realize that the panic can easily take over in an emergency situation. Learning and using the escape equipment needs to be automatically. So even a few seconds of exposure to sound or toxin can be catastrophic. So it is essential for to arrange training and to train personnel about the reason why the escape respirator is necessary in the first place. A healthy respect for the consequence of exposed to the hazard will increase the likelihood that the workers will actually use an escape respirator in an emergency situation. So with that, in summary, by you spending the time to choose and deploy the best respirator for your emergency application, you will need to support a solid line of defense, which we mentioned the three layers of defense too, which will protect your workers and finally your organization accept the emergency response plan. So with that, um, I will carry on my presentation. Uh, before I actually end the presentation, I would like to have a quiz question with you guys. So um, the quiz question is, most of the fire-related deaths are caused by fire and burns, trips and fall during the escape, or toxins from smoke, such as carbon monoxide. Yes, most of the guys have to get correct. Um, so the most related fire deaths are actually caused by toxics from smoke, such as carbon monoxide itself. So a lot of times this occurs in healing when you try to escape from a fire um, risk scenarios where the carbon monoxide could actually go to it. And basically there the filters you need to use specialized filters so that you could actually filter away, I would say, react away with the carbon monoxide. That's why we are actually offering the fire smoke food. And a lot of times fire food actually irritates your eyes and prevents you from the right escape scenarios. So um, thank you for your participation for the presentation. And I hope I share some very helpful information with you guys.
um, I pass on to Mr. Yu to start off with the Q&A session. Thank you, Mr. Yu. Okay, everyone. I hope um, we have um, given you some idea of uh, these uh, escape devices, especially um, each of you come from different background and there are different levels of uh, applications to select the right type of escape devices, especially where you may have to decide whether a future escape or a uh, self-rescue, oxygen rescue um, escape device would be suitable for your kind of application. So today, uh, this is a time for you to raise your questions um, that you may have. Uh, we realize that uh, we have many of you attending this uh, session today. So feel free to drop in your questions in the question box so that we could uh, respond and at the same time uh, share with everyone uh, what are the some of the concerns that may be experienced in the um, the uh, in the market. So maybe the I will read out to you some of the questions uh, and uh, Michael will be this will help us to answer some of these questions. Okay. Um sure. So, okay, here it says uh, when using the Pirate 3000, uh, does it mean the user need to perform fit tests to identify the correct size? Okay, so for the Pirate 3000 series itself, there's two models, the 3001 and 3002. One is actually the respirator cup size. This will require a general fit test to ensure that there's the the guys actually, I mean, the employees that the workers who actually have the right fit to the respirators. So, in any situation that the respirator type fail, we will actually offer the trick nano model, which is the mouth bead type. The mouth bead will do not require any fit test and can be used with customers that has a facial hair use on it. Um, so, there's the two different type of design. Of course, the respirator design could be a better comfort in terms of escape, but um, for specific scenarios and offering within our region, most of the time we will go with the multi types. But again, uh, the multi types will require more training from my recommendation because uh, not all of us is, are used to actually don on, to actually bite onto the mouthpiece to breathe through the mouth. So um, we could actually arrange the training with you guys to actually run through all this so that they do not actually have to buy the training set to do the fit testing. Mm. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, Please uh, continue to keep the question coming. We are getting some more uh, on the line. Um, question is also asked uh, about toxin. I guess this question refer whether this type of uh, different type of uh, escape devices, uh, what does it protect from what type of chemical? Michael? Mm -hmm. So, uh, sorry, uh, toxin, protect against chemicals. Yes. Sorry, can I repeat a question again, please? Um, there's a question that just put toxin. I I am assuming that the participant is asking uh, these uh, escape devices. What are they protected from? What kind of toxin? Oh, okay. So in general, that most of the industrial toxin, as long as really your normal application, you use the respirator mask, the escape respirator will actually give you the protection against this. So um, we protect against organic vapors in the, which is known as the A class. Inorganic vapors, not the B class, and we also protect mm -hmm. against ammonia and certain kind of special gases. So for all these different type of gases that you might have coded, whether do your escape respirators protect you against? You can actually log on to our Dragon Voice website and do the chemical substance to actually have a check. Um, what type of filters do they protect against, and what is the occupational exposure limit? So, example, um, for chemicals, most of the time we actually know, I mean, the most of the escape products is protecting against this H2S. For H2S product, um, the, we mentioned this 5 ppm maximum. So, you can look at the regular voice and you actually see that they actually recommend it as a B filter. So, that means all escape respirators must have a B rated filter. If any scenario, like organic gases, which actually have body point less than 65 degrees Celsius, they will not able to use escape respirator. They will require to use escape devices, which is like the 
saver, which comes with an escape cylinder, or even our bus cord or bus micro that works with supply airline. Yes, okay. I hope that answers the question. Okay. And I, I think uh, in, in case Michael uh, did not address uh, your question carefully, uh, correctly, please uh, let us know again. Okay, I'll proceed to other questions okay. that's been raised. Um, what type of respirator is suitable to handle spillage such as uh, hydrochloric acid or sulfur acid from a broken stock bottle? From a broken stock bottle. What's the last bottle. three words, sorry? Oh, okay. Broken stock uh, bottle, yeah. Uh, broken bottle itself. Okay, uh, usually we are depending on the concentration as well. So uh, we have to ensure the exposure limit is not above what the potential factor of the escape respirator is. So let's, assume, uh, let's do the assumption that it's the potential factor of the respirator could affect it. Uh, usually we will actually look at the 3200 series uh, B class or uh, we have an escape hood, which is the 4000 series. Mm, okay. Okay, okay. This question is asked, but I'm not sure whether we can answer it today. Um, I think okay. uh, Michael has uh, addressed it uh, just now, but if we buy the parrot, will Draeger provide free fit tests? <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe we could contact separately in that list. For the fit test, yeah. um, depending on areas um, and location of the customers, um, our driver representative from individual region, uh, you can contact with your driver representative and we will do some arrangement with you specifically in regards to this. Because different mm -hmm. regions, different countries have different requirements and also have different, uh, we'll say, different, might, there might be or might not be a different cost allocated to it. So it has to be certified to a certain country itself. So I could not as, uh, answer this question right from the webinar, but um, do contact us from the regular uh, our regular representative, and we will give you the offerings from that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Um, another question. Um, is there a sign protection factor for respirators? Is yes. there a sign so, protection factor for respirators? Yes. Yes, sir. So yes, there is. Uh, regardless, it's for escape or actually for industrial working. All respirators have the assigned protection factors. For example, for a full face mask, you can go up to two thousand. But again, um, that has to be look at what type of uh, chemicals that is been um, I mean, you're exposed to, and the type of um, mask or respirator that is assigned to it. So for our three thousand escape three thousand series, even the mouthpiece. There is an APF factor uh, allocated to it. Mm, so for okay. food, I think for food, I think it's around uh, 1,000, but I just need to double check again. Okay. And then for some of this uh, question that's raised uh, during this uh, webinar, we will also summarize it and provide for all participants so that uh, we can then subsequently be in touch with you all and uh, let us know if you still need further query. Okay, um, there are some more questions inside, and here there are people also asking, are there cartridge or filter selection guide available? Yes, for respirator, definitely. Uh, we, mm -hmm. we, will send, we can send it out to you guys. We have a filter selection guide uh, available in our Dragon website. There's filter from the EN approval filters. Uh, it has two different types. One is actually lit up from the chemical, and in any situation that you do not know the chemical, we do have a very rough recommendation on the application. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yes, that's yes, available for us. No problem. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Uh, someone is asking about the question that I'm reading. Uh, it doesn't seem to appear on the slide because for the webinar, the questions are appearing on the panel that is only seen by the uh, presenter and myself. But uh, rest assured, we will summarize these questions and uh, we will then send to you a consolidated slide slot together with today's presentation. Uh, okay, the other question asked uh, is, why does Draeger limit the power escape hood to 15 
minutes only to max of 15 minutes only. Okay, so the maximum time, there's no, we do not know the maximum time of the escape hook. We can only say at least 15 minutes for the escape hook itself. And um, that, the testing itself from the uh, from the Germany, uh, from Germany uh, registered third party is that they are testing the hooks for a, for a period that you, have, you can use it for more than 15 minutes so that we can say it's at least 15 minutes. So the approval status is actually 15 minutes. Um, you might encounter other brands in the market that say up to 30 minutes, but because that is tested under the, usually we, we know as from the China regulations, China regulations do say 30 minutes because their testing time is 30 minutes, but that is depending on the individual country testing requirements for the testing bodies. So from Germany, we are testing at least 15 minutes. We test more than 15 minutes, but at the minimum, at least 15 minutes for the approvals. So the approvals will be 15 minutes. We don't guarantee more, but we guarantee on the at least side. That is based on the testing mm -hmm. results. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ken, thank you, Michael. Okay, uh, another question is asked, if we have exposure to two types of chemical, example, mercury and benzene, what is suitable cartridge to use? Suitable cartridge to use mercury and benzene. Okay, just let me double confirm on the benzene. Mercury is actually for the K-type respirator. Benzene, uh, I need to double confirm that I remember vaguely is actually on the A-type respirator. So uh, uh, for escape respirators itself, all our models, the 3000 series and the powerful escape hoods could be used for this particular scenario, which uh, covers the mercury and benzene. Mm, okay. But in terms of industrial working respirators users, um, we would, again, I mentioned we will need to actually look into your concentration and what is the mask that you use. So we will calculate the uh, exposure limits in order to offer the right type of respirators mm -hmm. for your scenario. Mm -hmm. I see, okay. I guess more, more of such information is also available in the selection guide, right, Michael? Yes. Filter selection guide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The selection guide is actually more of the industrial working filters um, mm -hmm. that can raise just a generation guideline. Uh, for mm -hmm. escape respirator itself, um, we do also have a selection guide as you for you guys. But the slides today share will actually cover most of the inquiries. Mm -hmm. Okay. We since we still have some time, uh, please feel free to raise your questions. We have still some more questions to answer, but uh, I will encourage the rest of the participants. If you have any other questions, please feel free to raise your question now. I will proceed to the next question. What is the purpose of small cylinder attached on PS passcode airline harness? Actually, we have connected this airline harness with the BA trolley cylinder. For that case, do we need to still install small BA cylinder. Michael? Okay, so my recommendation is yes, the small BA cylinder um, or the cylinder that's actually attached to the harness is but mainly to use for escape scenario. So in any situation that the airline trolley fails, somehow or rather the air is not supplying the right pressure or actually there's a breakage in the supply air hose line. The warning whistle sound off, the guys that are heavy mending the air supply trolley will actually inform the, the guys that are using the supply airline ready to escape. He could actually turn on the cylinder and detach his, his supply airline and goes for the escape for at least 10 minutes. So they will provide the supply air and that is reducing the exposure to breathing in any contaminants in any situation that your face mask has less positive uh, pressure compared to the standard ambient uh, pressure itself. So most importantly, that small cylinder is designed for escape scenarios only. Ken, okay. Okay, another question is asked about training and uh, product introduction, I believe, to customers. Uh, just want to inform uh -huh. the participants here. Today we have uh, participants from uh, various countries in the ASEAN region. 
So the your name is uh, being taken note and uh, the respective sales uh, or marketing rep in the country will be in touch with you to answer this question about product training. Okay. So uh, another question is now asking what is the shelf life of SCBS cylinder back plate and airline accessories? Um, Michael, do you want to answer this? Okay, uh, we will contact to the customer, I mean, uh, customer having this question directly in regards to this. But uh, in general terms, for cylinders, the shelf life is actually up to maximum 15 years for com common composite. Uh, if you're talking mm. about other cylinders, we have longer shelf life. But if you're talking about other cylinders that require a longer shelf life, that depending mm. on the materials of cylinders. However, the shelf life doesn't mean that you you just leave it there for 15 years. You still have to do periodical testing on the cylinders every year and hydro testing every five years for the cylinders. So um, as for the assessment, again, uh, we don't mention it as a shelf life. I will say that I will recommend for all these equipments to be serviced periodically every year on the annual inspection because there will be minor, minor parts of different accessories for the airline or even the breathing apparatus that cause breakages that you might not know of. Uh, what we commonly see is actually the demand bar, the tiny membranes inside, and the isolation bar membranes that actually cause a little bit of breakages of thicknesses. So every year inspection will actually let us to find out these unseen has, I mean, potential changes of these spare parts. So instead of shelf life, for this specialized equipment, I would say uh, every year inspection. Mm, okay. Okay. Um, another question: Is there any uh -huh. indicators on the cartridge if it is full? I'm not sure whether this question is okay. asking whether the cartridge is expired or used. No. Okay. I I assume this question is asking about the service life of the cartridge regardless if it's escape mm. or working cartridges. So, um, no, to be honest. Uh, again, for working working industrial cartridge, um, we will rely on the individual to do, to do the changing of the cartridge. That means increase of breathing resistance or I occur a smell of the chemical or I start to have blockages of the filters itself, then I will change it. For indication, on the cartridge, it becomes a very mythical understanding because again, different cartridge works differently in terms of filtering device. There is very hard to provide a correct indication for the customers to ensure the changes. And in any case, does the indicator fail? And if the worker is not being trained to notice that, he really relied on the indicator, this will actually cause a catastrophic situation. So from safety perspective, we don't recommend it. We recommend the user must be trained and understand when to change the filter cartridge. That's why no indicator is being installed into the filter cartridges. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Um, we have one question more. Uh, what type of respirator to be used for hydrogen sulfide? I assume that this question is referring to escape respirators. That's nice. So for escape respirators, uh, all respirators can be used for hydrogen sulfide, it's true. But again, uh, we are, if we are talking about the 3000 series, 4000 series, which is the escape filter respirator device, we will need to know what is the maximum potential concentration of H2S that you will be exposed to in any of the accidents. Because Maximum, we are looking at around 2,000 ppm for the escape hoods. Now we tested around 2,500, but um, we are looking at 2,000. Anything that above that, you will require to use the supply airline. Again, H2S is a very dangerous gas, and it's only 5 ppm on the exposure limits. So a calculation is required. You should use escape hood or escape respirator, or you should actually use the uh, self-contained cylinder type of escape devices. You need to know the filling of the H2S that you are facing in order to do the operation. Other than that, assumingly we are looking at 1000 ppm of the H2S, then 
all our respirators are able to offer. Mm, okay. Okay, um, we've got a last few more questions here before we end. Uh, okay. Michael, no problem. Can, anyone, can anyone wear an escape respirator mask? Can anyone wear an escape respirator mask? Okay, for the mask type, no. If you have uh, face deforming um, scenarios, or I mean, if the customers have facial hair, or somehow the face uh, is a little bit deformed, he cannot wear the respirator type mask. However, he can use the mouthpiece if type, unless there's a there's a um, quite clinical condition to the mouth, then we will recommend the escape hood. For escape hood, all person could be wear because it covers it all. But for respirator, no. For hood, yes. Okay. Okay, um, I'm not sure this question is related earlier. Will an uh, escape mask mm -hmm. protect me if there is a fire? Okay, the escape mask will not protect you against any fire. The escape mask will actually protect you against inhaling poisonous gases during the fire scenarios. For example, like smoke, which contains carbon monoxide and other uh, um, hydrogen cyanide, this kind of um, dangerous gases, it protects you from inhaling these gases in. And the smoke particles that is generated out in the fumes, it protects the filtration for breathing, but it does not protect against fire. And second, the hood itself, it actually gives a better visual, so that means the smoke will not irritate your eyes during escape. There is a various type of escape devices during for fire, but a hood is very much recommended for escape from fire because it protects your head against um, potential fire blinds and allows you to actually see what's in front compared to the rest of the non hooded type respirator. Um, um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think I think Michael, you you had present during in your slide to show that different type of escape masks, uh, both for chemical as well as for um, carbon monoxide, which is uh, for smoke escape. So that maybe uh, yes. the participant can review the slide when we make it available for you, so that you can at least differentiate the different type of escape masks for different applications. Um, can I wear escape respirator if I have a bit sounds, sounds familiar to the first question, uh, the earlier question. Mm -hmm. Can yeah, I wear I, uh, if I have a bit? Yeah. Yeah. So as I mentioned, uh, if you are talking about the nose cup, the three thousand, three thousand one, that we call it, the nose cup mm -hmm. respirator type is a bit no, but you can use the mouthpiece instead, or you can change the hood type. So the hood type or the mouthpiece, you can use that, and no fit test is required. So that model can be used. But if you're using the nose cut model, the respirator model, you will not, you cannot use it with a beard. So sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, last two questions. Since it is maintenance free, yeah? since the, these are free respirators mm -hmm. are maintenance free, uh, do I need to inspect or maintain it? Mm, you will need to inspect it and maintain, yes. So uh, first, the, let's talk about inspection. Um, all our respirator comes with um, anti-temper seal. So the inspection will be looking at the respirator to ensure that the respirator is not being tempered with, or as, especially if you're placing your respirator in specific location for escape, uh, that could be a chance that it could be um, caused by um, competition. Second is to ensure you need to inspect uh, so from the outlook to ensure there's no damage to the escape respirator. Even though we do, the escape respirator comes with the hard cover most of the time, but it could also cause there could also be dents or breakages that will actually cause the humidity that actually goes into the escape respirator to actually cause the malfunction. Then it will become useless as an escape respirator. So yes, you need to inspect periodically to ensure everything is intact and is good and ready for use. For maintenance, yes, all respirators are designed to be maintenance-free. Um, however, 
during the specific lifetime, uh, you will need to send back to us. We recommend that to change out the filter at the end of the filter life. So, example, for the pile of smoke food, um, it's actually changing out the filters every eight years. So, we, with the yearly inspection, uh, plus the changing out of the filters every eight years. So, for other devices, uh, which is like the Oxy, it's maintenance free for 10 years. You will actually need to look at the humidity glass, uh, humidity glass to ensure that no humid goes into the Oxy uh, self rescuer to actually affect the chemical inside so that your zero and really any accident happen, you could escape safely. Okay. Thank you, Michael. I uh, just uh, one last question now. Okay, mm -hmm. this is also quite common. The, the common question asked: Do user need to be trained on all these escape risk respirator? I think there there was a similar question raised earlier. Also, do the user need yep. to be trained? Yes. Um. Um. Let the last question. We mm -hmm. will recommend. Yes. Okay. So. The most important thing is that even though the most of the escape rate aspirators are designed to be very user friendly, uh, just turn on and use, but uh, you can have the best of things in the world, but if they do not know how to use it or be regularly or frequently, it is the panic situation occurs during an emergency situation can overtake the general common sense. So the training is actually to provide the user familiarizing. Uh, the escape products and make it as a muscle memory product and muscle memory effects that you can actually know how to don on the respirator during a uh, situation. But in any scenarios that there's no training and you do leave it there, um, any accident happens can cause panic and during the panic, it will take longer to wear it or to actually realize how to wear it. And a lot of times, a few seconds can have very catastrophic effects. So from my standpoint of view is that you will require periodic or regular training for your product, actually for the escape product, to ensure the workers are know what to do and know how to use it during an emergency situation. Okay, Michael, thank you so much. I thought I one just one question just came in. I thought maybe you should quickly address. Uh, okay. Um, sure. Uh, is, is there any respirator suitable for? Pregnant woman working in the labs. I think so. Maybe need respirator to talk to the suitable for. Sorry again. Pregnant woman. Are there any respirators suitable for pregnant woman working in labs, laboratory? Wow. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe I'll need to do a double maybe check on this because uh, we will we will take this offline. I will I will advise the in regard to this because um, there will be some medical check in regard to this as well. Uh, but then I might yeah. not be able to answer immediately for this question. Okay. Um. Can anyway? Thank you. Okay, Michael. Thank you very much for today and for your presentation and also for answering all these questions. I, I believe there may be more questions. Uh, but uh, the respective uh, driver officers will be in touch with the participant and we will then uh, hope that we can also um, look into closer um, opportunities to work together with you all. So once again, I thank you for your time to participate in this question and rest assured that uh, today's uh, presentation material and the summary of the questions will be prepared and then we will share with all the participants. So once again, I thank you. And now I will hand over this time to Xiao Ping. Right. Um, we have also recently changed our Southeast Asia website with a new outlook and updated event. So you can actually scan this QR code, which will direct you to our new Southeast Asia website. So we have now come to the end of the webinar. Thank you very much for attending. So have a good week ahead. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Hope to see you all and hear from you all soon. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone, Bye. for attending the webinar session. Goodbye.